Hello everybody, my name is Clancy's and welcome to the Clancy's Dumagute podcast. So without further ado, let's get into today's uh, podcast and podcast video if you're watching on YouTube. So before I start with, uh, the, with today's topic, I would like to make an announcement. So this announcement is kind of like long overdue, but it was also mixed with a lot of fear for me to do this because I don't want to come off as ah oh, guys please no i i really didn't i think if you listened in my previous uh podcast where i was talking about the attitudes ubuntu and all that stuff that i said in my previous uh, podcast video you may understand why i was hesitant to do what i finally did so what did i do as you guys know that uh, many of you do communicate with me off site meaning that you send me emails and then we have a conversation there either you're suggesting video um podcast ideas or you are suggesting something to me or you're asking me questions about um apartments or real estate in south africa and things of that nature and i've also had a lot of you very many of you who have asked me if they can make a donation to me because they want to appreciate me for the work that I do. For a very long time, I've been pushing such um, people and saying, no, 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 it's fine. I enjoy what I'm doing. Uh, you don't have to pay me for it. But some people feel like, no, um, this is to encourage you. Perhaps you want to pay your Wi-Fi or you want to buy a certain equipment to improve on your craft and things like that. And then that kind of made me think because... I do have a faulty mic. I do have uh, my camera as well needs a lens. So currently the lens that I have, it just creates like a box instead of like landscape type of videos. And that doesn't look really nice, especially when it's now posted on YouTube. So it's just like a small box and I want it to be like how you see this one that you are watching. So I need a lens and those lenses are extremely expensive. So that kind of like made me think like, hmm, that person made a very good point. Like, no, this is just to improve your, your, your settings, whether you need equipment or whatever the case is and you may not be able to afford. So this uh, eventually uh, led me to create a pen pal. At first they said a cash app. I didn't understand what a cash app is. I don't think we do have cash app here in South Africa. Um, but I have heard of PayPal before. Again, this is South Africa. South Africans are not pretty much, and I'm not speaking for all South Africans here. If you're a South African, go like, yeah, speak for yourself. Okay, fine. Let me speak for myself. I have not heard in South Africa where we have a provision like a Cash App. I've heard of PayPal before, but Cash App, no. I've never heard of Cash App before. I doubt that many South Africans actually have Cash App um, in this country. If they do, that means I am living under a rock somewhere. But anyways, uh, I did open a, uh, a, pay a PayPal account. Is it an account? Or, so a link of some sort. And uh, of course, then I sent it to... Um, to one of the one of the subscribers, uh, I did not ask her for for permission if I could mention her name. But anyways, she did not. Uh, uh, well, I did not ask her for permission if I could say her name here in in, in on my podcast video. But uh, so I sent her the link. The next thing I knew, literally less than three minutes, I see a hundred and fifty dollars being sent in my PayPal. Of course, the world seemed to stop. I was like, what? Do you understand what is $150 in South African rands? That's over 2,700 rand. I was like, my heart was palpitating. And number two, I'm not sure if I ever told you that I'm a cancer. And if you know anything about cancers, and by the way, my birthday is coming up on the 14th of July, uh, we are crybabies, especially when an act of kindness is shown to us, we weep. So I try to hold it back, but of course, because I'm a cancer, it, I just went, bah. 
<laughs> Why would somebody send so much money to me? <laughs> All I do is just speak my mind about the things that I've experienced and observed. And then, of course, once I was done, the crybaby scene, I sent a barrage of gratitude messages. I just could not stop. I was not quite sure whether uh, to stop to say thank you because I had no words other than to say thank you that could come out or I could think about. So um, if you do send me a cash app, please don't go that far. It's okay. Whatever you can afford, I'm happy with it. Uh, eventually, we will get these equipments that this equipment that I need uh, to improve um, this family that uh, I am building with you. And I'm so grateful to each and every one of you who support me wholeheartedly. Those emails that I get, to, just to say thank you for what you do. Thank you for teaching me. Oh my goodness, I learned a lot. And then you engage me with other things as well that you are curious about South Africa and the people of South Africa and uh, the opportunities that are in South Africa. I highly appreciate that. I think that there was another brother who wanted to give me like $500. And I was like, no, bro, no, 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 no. Simply because I had gone to look at a an apartment that he's going to be staying at for the next, uh, I think, six months as of October this year. So I did go there and I checked the place out, took photos and videos, and then I sent it to him. And he was so grateful. And he's like, oh, I want to send you something uh, to say thank you. And I was like, what do you want to send me? He's like, no, I want to send you $500. Do you have a cash app? I was like, oh, no, no, no. I'm not going to take that. I did that from the bottom of my heart all for free. I did not expect anything. So um, <laughs> my fear is that once I embed my uh, PayPal link in the description box where I'm going to be leaving it, then he's going to have that opportunity to send me that money and I'm going to send it back. That's a lot of money. Um, that's a lot of money, seriously. I appreciate the little, um, whatever you can afford, the little. I I'm okay with that. Please uh, believe me when I say that. So other than this, uh, I'm just so grateful to each and every one of you. And I also want to welcome new subscribers on YouTube. You guys are showing so, so, so much love. So I thought, let me be transparent about this that has just transpired, that now I have a, uh, a PayPal. And of course, the money is going to go a long way in improving uh, what I'm trying to achieve here. This money as well, by the way, just to... Uh, expand on, on my transparency. I've realized that there are African Americans that are living in Cape Town, African Americans that are living in Durban, and I would like to reach out to those people and and sit have a sit down with them and have like an interview type of setting so that I can bring this to your attention, their lives here in South Africa. This is if you are thinking of moving to South Africa, either as a retiree or as a digital nomad, because all these African-Americans are here in their different diversity and different fields of work and things like that. So I would like to have a sit down with them. And there are more and more young people, by the way, that are also coming here and they are taking student uh, visas. Uh, I've met already two that I in my former university, Wits University, and we were just having a conversation and just chopping it up. And uh, I think there are some as well in uh, the University of Cape Town. I would like to fly to these guys, have a sit down and talk to them. And I think having this PayPal account will enable me to reach, excuse me, to reach these people at some point once we've made arrangements to have a sit down. There are also a lot of other sit downs that I'm going to be doing with uh, my personal African-American friends whom I've become really, really close with. They are living here in Johannesburg. We hang out now and again. Unfortunately, I, I have not been hanging out with them recently because I've been really, 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 really busy at work. And these days, my job kind of like takes me out of the province and I can't uh, hang out with them. But I have spoken to them before and said, hey, guys, I would like to have a sit down interview with you 
for my podcast channel and uh, basically we'll talk about your experiences uh, thus far living in South Africa. Kosam arrived in December 2022 and uh, the other one arrived, uh, where are we now? April. I think he arrived in April. So I would like to hear their perspective and and things like things like that that I can bring to your attention so that you too you can live vicariously through them or actually confirm some of the doubts that you may have had about coming to South Africa and things like that. So I thought let me expand a little bit more on that transparency as to what I'm intending to do with your donations should you donate. <laughs> So I'm going to leave the link of my PayPal in the description box. You can check it out there. I think I'm also going to leave it on my about under my about channel. I'm not quite sure if it's going to be linkable. We'll see. But in the description box, definitely you'll be able to click on it. If you can't click on it, then you can go under my about of the my YouTube channel and you will see an email address there. Then I can email it to you. So yeah, <laughs> thank you in advance. Should you, um, this is not uh, compulsory at all. Please don't feel compelled. Don't feel guilty. Don't feel anything. If you if you don't have, you don't have. I I'm okay with that. <laughs> Seriously, I'm very much okay with that. So um, there's no force there. So yeah. So what I want to talk about today is um, something that has been sitting on my mind. And let me make a disclaimer because I notice. That there are some people that come into my comment section completely misunderstood what I'm talking about. Sometimes I feel like what some people is deliberate, maybe they are trying to shut me down from doing what I do, and uh, they just make a comment carelessly with the most rudest tone you can ever imagine. Uh, there's no correction or a type of okay let me educate you it's more like they are trying to be superior superior to me i'm not quite sure what they think i am stupid or something and then when i respond in kind then they think that i'm the one who's rude and yet you're the one who comes at me barking and then when i stop you and then you now get offended so i want to make this disclaimer once again what i am talking about here it's not universal gospel truth or universal gospel uh, it. This is my observations. These are my experiences. And these are the things that I think about when I'm sitting on my own. Uh, most of the time I am, I am on my own. So when I speak of what I'm talking about, and if it does not affect you or it's not your experience, then rather keep quiet, say nothing in the comment section because I'm not talking about you. The moment you feel some, some type of way, then you must know that it's not about you. I'm not talking to you either. I'm talking about what I'm experiencing, what I'm observing and things like that. And I bring it to the attention of my viewers who learn something out of those experiences and observations. So I don't think you can take away somebody's experiences and observations and how they see these things in their own way. So when you come and try to invalidate my feelings and my thoughts, then there's something definitely wrong with your intellectual understanding. And I'm not quite sure if I should come down to that level when we talk to each other. I'm not quite. That's why you feel like when I respond, I respond um, rudely. Because that's what I was accused of by this individual. Then I said, you know what? Then in future, please don't come to my comment section. If you're going to deliberately misunderstand me. Because they took one little thing and made it into a big thing. And I'm thinking, I've said so many things in that pod podcast. And you are only coming up with that little thing. And then that little thing has absolutely nothing to do with you. I don't get it. But anyways, um, the topic that I want to talk about today again if this is not relevant to you, and I'm not talking to you, my African-American friends, I'm talking to my South African subscribers or viewers that might feel some type of way and say, 
that is my observation, my experiences, because I've been exposed to African Americans before, and I've seen how we interact with each other in the past and even now. Uh, now that many are coming into the country, so if you feel some type of way, then you must just know it's not about you. So the topic that I want to talk about today is uh, it's a mixture of things that I think I beginning to understand about the differences that we may see uh, between African Americans and, and and Africans. But again, I would like to speak on what I know and what I know. Is South Africa. I don't want to speak for any other African countries. There are 54 countries on the African continent and I'm just going to talk on my country and then the other 53 countries. If other Africans are watching, they can also comment in the comment section and either confirm what I'm saying. Maybe it's universal in Africa. I'm not sure, but I would assume it is universal what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, one thing that I'm beginning to learn about the differences between African Americans and Africans is because of uh, our ignorances of each other. I think we don't know much about each other and then in as much as the transatlantic slave trade uh, stole some of our people and spread them across the Americas and the, and the islands as well as in Europe, they also managed to um, to twist some truths about their homelands, about their culture and languages, and basically just strip them off completely of their dignity and everything about them, and uh, and shaped this particular mindset about Africa and Africans, and hence today. There are some African Americans that believe that Africans don't like them. Yes, this is a propaganda that was instilled in many African Americans by the by the um, what do you call this uh, the, the kidnappers that oh no you those people no longer want you there they hate you and things like that and that becomes like a generational truth that Africans don't like African Americans and then on our side as well because we are not taught uh, transatlantic slave trade many Africans don't even know that slavery did take place many Africans think that African Americans have always been African Americans they they don't come from Africa yes we may look uh, alike which I'm also going to talk about the beauty standards particularly here in South Africa again this is my experience as we were growing up when we would compare uh, a beauty, uh, standard of beauty and we would say if a black person a black South African that looked if you're a guy if you looked somewhat smooth looking like you were handsome they would usually say oh he looks like american meaning like black american so meaning that black americans have always uh, taken the high standard of beauty the standard of beauty for a black person was an african-american please again if this was never your thing i'm not talking to you but in my circle of friends in my community Whenever we talked about a standard of beauty, it was always the benchmark being an African-American. Oh, yeah, he looks like American. Once the person say you look like an American, you just know that you are handsome if you were a guy. If you were a girl, especially if you had like a very silky, um, soft hair that did not look like, um, like nappy hair, then you would have that you'll be described as have has you'll be described as looking like an African American, and it was an honor to many of us that oh, so I look like a like an American. Uh, again, the reason why it uh, that uh, that came about it is not because we've come across African Americans before. I have come across, like I said, my English teacher was an African American. Uh, for six years and uh she was a lady so there was no way that i could benchmark her with other um with my fellow black south africans in terms of beauty she was a beautiful lady herself dark skin beautiful really 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 
held her head up high confident and she's the same person who also taught me confidence she's the same person who made sure that i was taken care of at school being the only black kid so she was quite protective she rallied around me throughout my primary school so um now where all this comes from this standard of beauty it comes from the movies that we used to watch uh if i remember very well if you were dark-skinned and you looked handsome you would be benchmarked against Wesley Snipe, for example. Or you'd be benchmarked in, in the 90s. Uh, if you looked really, really handsome, you'd be benchmarked against Will Smith. Or um, who else that I can think of? Uh, Terrence Howard. And uh, there's Denzel Washington. All these uh, Morris Chestnut, if you were even darker and you had like dazzling white teeth that perfectly corned you were you look like uh, uh morris chestnut and, and and people like that so there are a lot of other african americans that whenever we looked at each other and said oh yeah this one is good looking he's like you get what i'm trying to say oh he's got an african american look that type of thing so my point is we don't know each other and as we don't know each other, we have allowed a gap for naysayers and propagandists to, to occupy that space in dividing us and making sure that we don't know about each other. And the more we don't know about each other, the more fear of each other that built. That fear also developed into disrespect of each other. Because I have watched some videos on YouTube where um, maybe it's like a street, uh, what do you call this, a street social uh, type of setting where they will ask an African-American, uh, where is Africa? Or how many countries are in Africa? And they'll be like, I don't care. That type of uh, response, I don't care. I'm not in Africa. Or, hey, do you identify yourself as a black American or African American, they were like, oh, I'm not an African, you know, I'm an I'm American, I'm just an American, period. So you can tell that it's not because this is something they believe, but it is something that they've been taught or they've heard. And then as a result, they repel Africa and repel Africans. And some would even say, why should I care about, Af about Africans? They don't care about us, they hate us. Again, all this coming from that gap that was occupied by people who had bad intentions for black people all across the world. Uh, because this is not just an African-American thing, but it's also a, what you call this, a black diaspora thing. Because Jamaicans themselves, they don't know anything about Africans. If, even though Jamaicans, Barbados, or what you call it, Bohemians, as well as... Uh, Trinidad, <clears throat> Trinidadians and stuff like that, they still carry a lot of African culture with them. Even 400 years later, they still have a lot of Africa in them, but they still don't know much about the motherland, where they come from, why they practice what they practice, why they have this culture that they are practicing. Uh, which is so much that is which is which of most of it comes from Africa, and yet they know absolutely nothing, and they probably have their own propaganda that was told to them about Africa. With us here in South Africa, the moment you speak of Jamaica, the first thing that comes to mind is a stereotype. I know it is ganja and dreads, and I. Uh, Aman, IRA, that sort of stuff. We think of Bob Marley. We think of uh, uh, reggae. <laughs> Those are the things that come to mind when you think of Jamaica. And then if a Jamaican also had to uh, step in my in my personal space and immediately I pick up that they're Jamaican, suddenly I'm going to be speaking like a Jamaican man. <laughs> You get what I'm trying to say? All this is because of the ignorances we have of each other. None of us have said, hey, hold on. Can we just stop? Just to stop? And kind of like, we know that we are not going to uh, correct the injustices of the past. 
400, 500 worth of injustices against us as, as, a, as a black nation, uh, it's going to take a long time to correct that. But we are here now. Why don't we build a bridge? This is, this is supposed to be my conclusion, but I feel like I also need to include it here. Why don't we stop, try and start leveling the field, build a foundation for a bridge that we are going to build that's going to connect us. And then this bridge, we must all have a common theme for it that is going to round us all up and, uh, and unite us. By uniting us, it includes everything that might ever happen to us. We will just be this one ball that is unbreakable. We rally around each other should one of us is harmed. Injured, injured to one, injured, injury to all. That type of mentality. So the other thing that I've also noticed is that Many African Americans that have come here to South Africa watch their videos when they do reaction or their impressions of of uh, the, of South Africa, and they'll always talk about culture shock. Yeah, that is expected. Uh, you coming from the U.S. where probably everything looked different. And you did things in a different way. You come to an African country and then suddenly life looks a whole lot different. Some look almost as backward in your own thinking, but it's not backward to the people that are practicing whatever it is that they are practicing at the moment. Whether they're cooking on fire, there are a lot of people here in South Africa still cook on fire. Not because there's no, there's no electricity. Electricity is expensive, by the way. Uh, some people still go fetch water from the river. There are a variety of reasons as to why some people still believe in water from the river as opposed to water from the running tap. Now, water in South Africa is safe to drink. Yes, some parts of South Africa, mostly in like small towns, is questionable. But in the big cities, it is uh, it, the water is drinkable. South Africa is one of the countries in the world that has clean water to drink. As a person that's coming from the U.S. to South Africa, uh, drink our tap water, nothing is going to happen to you. However, it's still advisable that you buy bottled water. If you don't trust the, the 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 tap water, it's fine. But there are some people who just feel like uh, they feel more connected to I uh, maybe their ancestors by drinking river water and things of that nature. So those are the things that will shock you. Uh, the other thing as well that um, <clears throat> that will also become a a factor is culture versus religion. Some African Americans, I think I saw a, a, a video of an African American man who did a TikTok video and was talking about Africans. Yeah, I hear you Africans are worshiping ancestors. What nonsense is this? And he flipped the Bible and he started reading the Bible, worshiping of false gods or false uh, idols or something like that. He went on, on and on and on and on and on and on. Of course, Africans did not uh, uh, just rolled over and played dead. They responded to him in stitches. I think he did take down the video eventually because I don't see it on TikTok anymore. Uh, so you may come as well with that mentality and you get shocked to see how people, uh, their religions are. You, because some, especially in the Zulu culture, it's a very brazen how we worship our ancestors. In fact, it's not, it's not worship. This is not worship. Uh, there was a conversation I had with a fellow South African who said, "But it's not worship, though. This is our. This is how we do we do our practice. The worship is to God." And they're like, "Yes, that's actually correct. It's not worshiping ancestors. Or what we do, this is our cultural practices." So they're very brazen. You might come to South Africa, and at home, I'm having a tra a traditional do. Definitely, I will invite you. South Africans have a tendency of inviting their visitors to 
things like funerals. Don't think like, oh, wow, I was invited to a funeral. That's weird. I don't even know the person that passed away. No, it's got nothing to do with the fact that you don't know the person. It's got everything to do with celebrating the person life even though you did not know who the person is because once we get there i'll explain to you that oh the person that is in that box is so and so this is what they were this is the type of life they led blah 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 blah, blah. and then because that's the conversation conversation you're going to be hearing about that individual who is deceased so you will know about that individual and at the same time because we still believe that our deceased are our messengers who knows they might become your own messenger too to god regarding whatever that you might want from god so we would invite you because we want to share that experience with you and also share whatever uh goodness that may come out of that um that funeral so we might invite you might find yourself being invited to a wedding a lot of african-americans the moment they landed on a friday saturday they were dressed up in a tuxedo and they were going to a wedding or to a picnic or a party or something that every weekend something is happening in south africa you go to any community whether it's a township the rural areas uh or suburbs you will find tents all standing up because there's something going on there and then if you're a friend to a south african you'll be invited there definitely you'll find yourself invited those that are religious they will invite you to church on sunday basically show you how they worship god the other one that i've also uh, noticed was in position for example an african-american feels like no 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 you shouldn't do things like this you should do things this way basically you are take telling a culture that has been practicing this culture for thousands of years to stop doing it the, the way they are doing it but they should do it the way you know it how it's done in america that's another thing that I've also uh, observed and I've also seen in some of the uh, the impression videos like, no, it's like you see a cocoon, you see a cocoon, a cocoon, it looks like a worm and then the butterfly when it comes out of the cocoon, it looks very, very painful. So humanity will kick in you and say oh let me go let me go help this butterfly and release it from the cocoon that's actually how you paralyze it when you try to help it nature does not need to be helped because the moment you come and say i'm helping it that's when you're actually destroying it so when you come and try and impose a western practice on an ancient african practice you are injuring that practice so this is the thing that you need to do when you come across something like that leave it alone as a matter of fact what will help you to be even accepted in that community and that culture is to be part of it experience it who knows you may actually enjoy what you almost changed so if you feel the urge of trying to change something don't change it as especially when people who are doing this they have absolutely no issue about it then that is not for you to go and change for example i talked about virginity testing the other time when somebody came into my d uh, not in my dm in my email and said oh, but that's not right uh in searching i'm like i've never been to a virginity, virginity testing of a girl before but from what i've seen from those girls that are being tested they come back with such confidence that you've never seen in your life before and they have no issues they're not traumatized and they never live a traumatic life uh, they don't have like uh, ptsd about it i don't know what goes on there but what i do know is that it is part and parcel of the zulu culture and uh, I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon just because modernity has kicked in. So you might find yourself, let's say you have a 16-year-old daughter and your 16-year-old daughter is a friend with another 16-year-old daughter, a girl that she goes to school with. And then this girl is going to be going for virginity testing and she invites your daughter to go for a virginity test. <laughs> I know you are a parent of course you are going to make the final decision but it is not for you to tell your girl oh Bennett, that's barbaric why would they do something like that to to your friend 
then you are interfering in that culture. If you feel that that's not for you, then it's not for you. Leave it alone. If you want your daughter to experience the same thing and going to before the king carrying a reed, then it's a great experience for her. She might not necessarily go to to a virginity testing, but she can go to the reed dance to Umhlanga and and go gift the, the Zulu king a reed a reed. So uh those are the things that I'm trying to say that instead of imposing rather emerge yourself in that culture and experience it you might like it and believe me when i tell you again i'll speak for the zulus once you do that to us i'm telling you you become us immediately you become us immediately it same goes with language when you make an attempt to speak our language it's over you are part and parcel of us now. We'll give you a name, a surname. We'll even probably give, get a, some kind of, um, I don't know, uh, a title of some sort. <laughs> it might not mean anything. But um, those are the things that you will experience. There are ways of cooking that you may not like because you've never eaten food of that nature. Like traditional doom food, they mostly boiled with just salt. And then when we eat, we eat uh, men eat on their own, women they eat on their own. There's this, um, how do you put it? There's this platter that they put, it's like a wooden platter, we call it istebe. And then all men will surround istebe. So now we sit according to age group. So I will not be able to sit with men that are older than me. And I will also not sit with boys younger than me. I would have to sit with my age group and then somebody will cut the meat and then we all eat from that platter. So so those are the things that you are going to experience. And you're not going to sit there in a traditional do and think that a plate is going to be served to you. No, you have to go to the esteban and then probably they might even give you the knife to be the one to cut the first meat. Of the first bite so usually you take the first bite to eat before everybody start eating but you cut the meat you are responsible in cutting the meat into biteable sizes and then you dig in with your hand and you eat so you're not gonna stand there looking like a snob because once you do that we will feel like we've been rejected the moment we feel rejected we will reject you you will feel so alone and so rejected that you would want to leave and never come back. As a matter of fact, if you leave, we will never want to see you again. So you have to be part and parcel. Get in there. Get your hands a little dirty. Of course, they'll give you uh, water to wash your hands and a cloth to wipe your hands for hygiene purposes. And then you get in there. Same goes with our African beer. Nkombo tea, we call it, or sorghum. Um, it doesn't taste nice. I should warn you. Because even myself, I don't necessarily drink it. But when when Ukambi, the how do you call it again in English, the Calabash um, cup, when it comes along uh, in my direction, I hold it like this, and I, all I do is I put it against my lips, and then I make sure that the content inside touches my lip, but I don't drink it. I just make the content touch my lip. As long as they see that milkiness on my lip, then it means that I drank. And then I just pass it to someone else. And then I just wipe my lip. I did not drink it. I just touched my lip. That way, I'm showing respect to all my peers that I'm drinking this with. If I'm, I'm just going to say, no, no, pass it on. <sighs> It's not going to be nice. I will not have a very good experience. As a matter of fact, I will never get invited to another traditional do, whether it's a wedding or anything again. So that is something as well that you will may, you may experience if you are invited to traditional do's. That also includes funerals, weddings, anything that is going to involve a African culture in it. Just expect that there are some things that you may not necessarily uh want to experience but i will say to you open your mind open your heart 
to that experience. So now how do we uh, close this gap? Like I said earlier on, it's building a bridge. And this bridge, we need to have a theme to it. But before we do that, as we are building this bridge, we also need to learn about each other. Like I said, many Africans don't know anything about African-Americans. Absolutely anything except seeing African-Americans on television. On, or on the movies. That's it. That's the probably the nearest to an African-American some Africans have come across. So when you ask, do you know anything about African-Americans? They'll be like, uh, no. If you, sometimes they may not know that it's African-Americans, but, some many, some, but many Africans may know African-Americans as black Americans. They'll say, hey, what do you know about black Americans? The answer will be like, oh, I only see them in the movies. And that is an honest answer. And the other thing, because you're an, a black American coming from America, and uh, we see the money that is being rained on, uh, on, on music videos or in the movies, then the assumption, therefore, is, oh, they are rich. They got money. I know my friends that are African-Americans that are living here in South Africa, they get so irritated every time when they go to a store. The moment the store owner hears their accent, suddenly things change. Prices change. And um, I, I, I challenge them that we'll do a social experiment whereby we'll go to a South African shop and we'll go to a shop that is owned by a non-South African. And I said to them, if you go to a South African shop and you're an African-American, if an apple is 50 cents, to me, it's going to be 50 cents to you too. But if we go to a non-South African shop, they will say 50 cents to me because I'm a South African and they know that I know this apple is 50 cents. But the moment they hear your accent, they're going to say it's $5. This is a dishonesty that also upsets me especially now that it's happening here and I'm also getting exposed through my friends that there are people who are actually doing this nonsense which is giving us South Africans a bad name because it's happening here. You are experiencing it here in South Africa and, when you, you, and you don't know the differences between a South African and a non-South African. The fact of the matter is I went to a store in South Africa and then because they heard my, my accent, they increased the prices. But for the locals, it was a lower price than that. It's very upsetting. So those are the, where does that come from? It comes from the fact that many Africans believe that African-Americans are rich. They got money. So now I know, the, I know that there are Americans, black people, who are wealthy, but I also know that there are black people who are on welfare in the United States. And I also know that many African Americans, they, they, they don't, they don't, the minimum wage is $7 an hour. So where would I say, ah, these guys have money when I know that $7 an hour is nothing. That is an ordinary working African American in America. So the moment when African-Americans come to South Africa, in my mind, I'm not thinking these people have money. Not at all. But there are a lot of black people in South Africa or in Africa who, who believe that, oh, y'all got money. So again, I've said it before. Don't get upset. Don't get irritated. Yes, I know it's annoying. Just know that us as well, when we were taught about you, this is the propaganda they fed us about African-Americans, that y'all are comfortable. Not just comfortable, but wealthy, rich. And uh, now that you are here, you are here to come and splurge your money with us. Mm, this is great. And then we get disappointed when we hear that you don't have money. Like, are you sure you're American? Because I've heard that before, like... What kind of an American? What kind of Americans are these that don't have money? That's because they're in America. Try go to America yourself and come back and tell me that you are rich. So, um, so I will say it again: don't get irritated, don't get angry. But what you can do is, 
is tell them that this is not the price and be stern and firm about it. And if they continue to say it is, call a South African. Say, how much is this? You will see how they change their tone, how fast they are going to change their tone because in South Africa, prices are fixed. And in South Africa, we got what you call Consumer Rights Commission. And that commission's job is to regulate prices. And if anybody increases prices without informing the Consumer Rights Commission, then they are breaking the law. And therefore, you can write to them and then report that particular store. Many of these businesses know this because South Africans know this. You're coming from outside. You can look it up as well before coming to South Africa, this law, uh, Consumer Rights Act. You will learn a lot about that. That also includes uh, a returning policy. So let's say you bought something, you got home, it's broken, or maybe it's not what you, uh, you bought. You, you can take it back, but you need to have the receipt, though, to show that you purchased that item in that store. Or you can go to its sister store that is maybe nearest to you. Let's say you bought in the Mall of Africa and you're living in the south of Johannesburg, so you can go to the to Southgate and, and, and exchange or get your refund. So no store can tell you that, no, we don't do refund. It's, it's, that's not a South African thing. It's against the law. So what I'm trying to say is when you are in South Africa and somebody increases the prices, be stern. Otherwise, walk or go with a, <clears throat> go with a South African. They won't take chances. So the other point is compromise. So once we've learned about each other, then we need to agree on a consensus to compromise because there may be some things that you may not be willing to let go as an African-American coming from the U.S. And I may have some things that I might not want to let go because now I'm interacting with somebody that is coming from another culture. So it's always important, especially to Africans, to meet each other halfway. Let us meet half each other halfway. That way there's mutualism when it comes to respect. I respect your culture. You respect my culture. They, therefore, there will be no clashes between us. So like I said, this bridge that we are or oh, we have to build, it must bring us closer to each other. We need to kill this space that no one else will ever penetrate it again and then separate us. The rule and divide thing, we need to close it and become one. Because once we become one, can you imagine what we can create? One thing that you need to understand, the biggest population on the planet is black people. I believe that in buying power, we make over trillions of U.S. dollars. Trillions of U.S. dollars. If black people had to decide together as one that we are never going to buy from a, a shop that is not owned by a black person, many businesses will fall on their faces. All of them. If we had to wake up one morning, all of us as black people say no. If we, this item is not from a black person, we are not buying. Can you imagine what we can do once we build this bridge? And I know this bridge, they don't want us to build it. And they're going to come up with every possible tactic to ensure that this bridge collapses. And then in order for the bridge to collapse, well, you know what they will do? They will use some of our own it's going to be an internal job to destroy us. They will pay them money to destroy this bridge. They will make sure that we do not come together and become one thing. Because once we become one thing, we'll think alike. We will stop racism. Okay, somebody will say, oh, that's idealism. That will never happen. Okay, 
But what if one thing happened to us in an act of racism and we all decide if this matter is not going to be resolved, all black people around the world will not buy from Nike or will not buy from McDonald's or whatever the case is. Sorry. I know that McDonald's may not be involved. Why are you punishing them for? But what I'm trying to say is if we can pick one company that is owned by like those big conglomerates that have power to say, stop this racism. And actually something happens. So that's what I'm trying to say here, that if we, if one, something happens to one of us, we all rally around that person because we are united. This bridge we've built, we're saying no, no, no. Can you imagine what we can achieve? Can you imagine the business partnerships that are going to develop out of that? Can you imagine romantic relationships that leads to marriage and parenthood are going to emerge from that? Can you imagine the friendships that are going to come out of that? Can you imagine the brotherhood and the sisterhood that is going to come out out of that? Can you imagine what we can build together? You see that Wakanda that you saw in the Black Panther? That's a possibility. That is, if we learned about each other and close this gap and ensure that the narrative about us black people changes. I'm sure we will all influence each other to buy from black-owned businesses, support each other. Those are the things that are going to come out once we've built this bridge. It's going to be easy to transition to each other's territories as black people. And then when something happens to one of us, we all stop and go to that uh, one of us who is in distress. We defend them. We fight for them. We get justice for them together. Injury to one, injury to all. So once we are united and we are one, it's going to become very difficult for other people to take advantage of us black people. They'll be afraid because if they dared, we can boycott all of us. We are the biggest population on the planet. Yes, some of us may be poor, but there is still some money that comes in. And the moment they hear that we are not buying from here, I'm telling you, we can change our own fate if we wanted to. Yeah, they will beg us. They will beg and promise us that they will never touch us again. So those are the things that I am thinking about uh, when I'm sitting by myself. And yes, many of them are quite idealistic. But at least I am thinking, I am thinking that what are the possibilities if we had to think this way, all of us. That is why I'm so happy. I am so, so happy. You, you guys have no idea. I know I say this every time uh, on, the, on the podcast video uh, that I'm so happy that African-Americans are coming to Africa. Yes, there are those that say whatever it is that they say. I get it on my emails. People say, oh, you must stop calling me African-American. I'm like, then if you don't identify as an African-American, what are you doing watching my videos? I'm not talking to you. Why are you so um, touched? Because if something is it's irrelevant to you, then keep it moving. Why did you sit and watch throughout? Why did you feel the need to come to my email and then say the things that you are saying? Stay in your delusion. That's it. <laughs> the, your delusion has absolutely nothing to do with me. And it also has absolutely nothing to do with other African-Americans who identify themselves as African-Americans. So why are you here? I don't get it. So, um, like I said... Oh, if we all could think the same, if we all could come up with the same thing, 
that um, we need to stop being ignorant of each other, that we must learn about each other, our experiences, what our dreams, what our aspirations. Yes, we don't have a lot, but we can make something out of nothing, all of us. For once, the world will look at us with respect. They disrespect us right now because we are divided. Nobody defends the other. Every man for themselves. So that is why they are able to take advantage because we are divided. So we need to come together, learn of each other, learn of each other's histories, cultures, and experiences and pain, heal together, and then move forward as a unit. Because I think that is the solution, learning each other. Ignorance is not bliss when it comes to each other. That I can tell you. So I think that is all that I wanted to say uh, in today's podcast, podcast video, that um, as black people all over the world, we need to come together. We need to learn about each other and build a bridge that will e make it easy for each other to interact with each other, to build each other, to build a black nation that is untouchable. So I don't know. <clears throat> Please do let me know by commenting down below what you think. What do you think is the solution? What do you think that will solve the problems that African and African Americans are facing, black diasporans that are facing wherever they are. What is that solution? Because we cannot work on, oh, they hate us, oh, we hate them, oh, we, are hate, we, we hate each other, when there's no such a thing. There's absolutely no such a thing. So that is, those are my thoughts. And uh, I thought, let me just bring it to your attention. So if you liked the video on YouTube, give it a like. And uh, if you didn't like it, still give it a like. And also leave me a comment down below. Share this uh, video far and wide. I highly appreciate it, especially when you give me a like. Liking a video, guys, on YouTube, it helps the channel to grow. So please help me to grow. I would like to get to a thousand subscribers by my birthday, like the 14th of July. Please give me with that. Thank you. <laughs> um, anyways, guys, uh, it was great being here. I, I always enjoy being here. Uh, sometimes my thoughts will be all over the place. And if it was all over the place in this podcast, do forgive me. But I think you, all, you get what I'm trying to say here. Um, uh, I'll highly appreciate it if you continued to interact with me on email. Oh, by the way, I, I kind of like revived an old Instagram page, which I named it after the podcast channel on YouTube, uh, Clantis Dumagute Podcast. You can go there at Clantis Dumagute Podcast. Um, you can leave me a DM there and do also follow because I would like to resume that page and, uh, and do great things. Like I said, I want to start traveling to where African-Americans are in South Africa so we can have like a sit down and then I can bring it to your attention and we can have more discussions and things of that nature. I would also like to reach out to African-Americans in other parts of Africa, like Ghana, Uganda, uh, Nigeria, Senegal, the Gambia, everywhere, Rwanda, Kenya, Ethiopia, wherever they are, I would like to reach out to them. And, um, and you guys, thank you so much if you are going to make that possible for me. So let's see each other again in my next one. Goodbye.